looking back, what engaged you with this area? As a politician, there are so many calls on your time, so many issues you could dedicate uh, a large chunk of your career to. What, it, what is it that made uh, the green economy, climate change, these environmental issues so front and centre for you as something you wanted to uh, wrestle with? Well, uh, I suppose uh, I'm a countryman, so I started off by having a real understanding and love of the countryside and seeing how things were changing. I mean, I had there was a very fundamental, basic environmental thing about uh, about looking after what we'd uh, been given, and and that was very important. Um, and then, uh, very early on in politics, I became Jim Pryor's parliamentary private secretary. Um, and that meant I became more and more interested in agriculture as a part of this. And when I became Minister for Agriculture, of course, I became very keen on moving the, Depart the Ministry of Agriculture into a department which really understood about the environment because it seemed to me that the future of agriculture depended on our becoming much more environmentally aware. And all the rest is history. And do you think that transition has been made? Do you think because the, the agricultural sector for many environmentalists is still seen as a bit of a, it's a slightly, um, slightly simplistic way of doing things, but often characterised as a bit of a bad guy? Do you think the agricultural sector has embraced these concepts over that time? Well, like most things, <laughs> some of it has and some of it hasn't. But um, uh, your comment characterises not so much the agriculture sector as environmentalist. I mean, I'm afraid they. Environmentalists as a whole um, uh, tend to uh, still remember the, 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 the particular objections they had 25 years ago. So you have, to ch you have to change absolutely radically before they'll come along with it. So sometimes I think the fault is not so much in, in agriculture as the people looking at agriculture. There's a great deal more to be done, of course. But of course agriculture's got to produce the food and we've got a real pressure and real balance to bring between the, the needs of food production and the transition to a much more uh, sensible way of looking after the land. And, and that's a very hard thing to do. And many farmers are part way along that, uh, that transition. Some have done much better than others and some uh, haven't started. But then isn't that true of every industry you think of and every person you think of? Um, you're also one of the first politicians, frontline politicians, to sort of pick up on climate change as, a, as an issue of importance and, and the need for decarbonisation. Um, looking back again, what, what was it that convinced you of the importance of this issue that has, has, is still failing to convince some of your colleagues? Oh, well, simply the science. I mean, I'll tell you the story. I mean, I was the Minister of State at Agriculture and uh, was responsible for the sea defences, and I had already read a certain amount about uh, global warming, as it was called, and was convinced by the argument, uh, convinced in the sense of thinking that it was the most sensible uh, view. The science was much less developed then, but it still seemed to me to be the most sensible view of what was happening. Um, and then we had a meeting to discuss sea defences, and all the officials were sitting around. And a very smooth man who was a senior official, because I used to make them all come in, because I wanted to know what the discussions had been. So you had all the officials, not just the one who was coming to bring the message after they'd had the discussions. So he said, we're very pleased, Minister, that you've uh, uh, asked us in, because we are able to tell you that there is no need to change the parameters of sea defences. Every 10 years we have this review, we've had a review, and I have to say, well, I'm happy to say, there's no need to change the parameters. So I looked at the whole lot of them and I said, well, is there anybody who has a different view from that? And a young man from the back said, well, if you believe in global warming, then you'll need to raise the standards to protect us against higher sea levels. So I said, well, I do believe in global warming and, and therefore I think we ought to do that. And the very smooth operator said, oh, how very brave, Minister. So you know you're in trouble. Uh, very brave, Minister. Um, you, um, uh, but uh, there's no point in seeking this because uh, the Treasury will never let you. Now, at the time, I was helping to write Mrs. Thatcher's speeches. So I rang her up and said, Prime Minister, you know, I've got this particular issue. And... Uh, and a voice from the other end of the phone said, John, there are two people in this government who believe in global warming, you and me. 
we are therefore a majority. Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> this attitude is very much, very much true. But it was the, the realities. You know, the, the, the fact was that all the evidence suggested that this was so. And I believe in, in I believe in, in dealing with risk. And I think you have to deal with these things in a, in a sense of way. It's exactly what Mrs. Thatcher would have said. She'd have said it's a, it's a matter of risk. Um, and uh, if uh, today it would be true to say if 95% if of the uh, avionics, uh, uh, aviation experts said that aeroplane's likely to crash, you wouldn't say, well, I'm very happy to rely on the evidence of a retired ex-aviation expert uh, and I'll go on the aeroplane. Because that's actually what these people say. This is what actually Nigel Lawson is saying. He's saying, don't listen to the vast majority of scientists. Listen to those few that I have chosen because I think it's rather embarrassing for us to have climate change. Well, it is embarrassing. I much prefer not to have climate change. It'd be very, very much easier. And I, I, I'd love to find a reason for finding we've got it all wrong. But there isn't a reason, and we have got it all right, and we'd better get on with him, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and sitting here... Um, at the hub of the well global insurance industry really that that industry's really hammered this home they they have looked at the risk and and gone hang on there's money at risk here this this needs to be managed well that was the very first thing that i thought um i always look at where the money is i'm cynical of so and so when it comes to that what's happened to the money and the money uh, in terms of the insurance industry has been uh, on the fact of climate change much longer than anybody else and I get rather cross with the uh, deniers who say, oh, well, they would do that because they get money out of it. Uh, actually, insurance industry doesn't invent risks. Insurance industry assesses risks. They get money anyway. You know the insurance industry. They always get money. It doesn't matter how they do it. But they do try to do it on a sort of rational and reasonable basis, and that's really what they've done here. Um, you mentioned there, just, uh, just looking, continue to look back, and we'll look forward in a second, but um, you mentioned Margaret Thatcher there, and, and she was... Um, even though she's idolized by many climate skeptics, she was she was one of the first world leaders to really get this agenda and 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 you know the the Paris process that we're about to come up to, she was there sort of kicking that off in a way in the late eighties. Yeah, I don't like the word climate skeptics because they're not skeptics. It's the scientists are skeptics. I mean, people like me, who, I'm not a scientist, but I, I look at the science and I'm, I, and I'm skeptical all the time. I ask questions. I, and if some new science comes up, my job as chairman of the Cl Climate Change Committee is to take that into account. Uh, the so-called uh, climate skeptics aren't skeptics at all. They've made up their mind. They're not listening. Um, they've decided it isn't going to happen, and they've decided that either because it's embarrassing for them to happen, or because they're contrarians, or because they're in the coal industry. Well, we can understand what that is, and one takes that. Free. And I've got a lot of them because I have, I have, I'm on the Twitter feed. So if you aren't on my Twitter feed, do join because I need supporters against uh, against my tr my trolls because I've got a lot of trolls because um, climate change has that effect on some people. Um, and uh, so it's at Lord Deben if you want to join. I was always uh, I'd, I'd, I'd thoroughly recommend it. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's a good, it's <laughs> a good one to follow. I mean, so it's a reasonable, uh, and I'm, I, of course, my my trolls are particularly nasty. But it, it's had a really funny effect on me. I'm, I'm, I've learnt something about myself on this because I had a particular troll called Jingle Balls, and um, and and he was he, he was uh, particularly nasty. Um, and I don't really read them when they're particularly nasty, but you've just sort of passed the eye over them, so to speak. And then about three months ago, he disappeared. And I haven't heard from him for about three months. And, you know, I've discovered that I'm really rather worried about him. I mean, I hope he's, I hope he's all right. You know, he might be ill or, or, or dead or something, you know. But, um, and, and it's really rather surprised me that one, 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 one gets used even to the worst of these people. He was really very bad indeed, but there we are. But, but the, the, the point about the, the, uh, about the people on the extreme right of the Tory party is that, that they don't listen to the evidence. Mrs. Thatcher wasn't like that. I mean, she was characterized like that, but she wasn't actually like that at all. She listened to the evidence. It, did, it was very embarrassing for her. She'd much prefer not to have believed in climate change. But once she'd done the science and seen that it was happening, she was not a woman who said, well, I just pretend it isn't happening. So she did do that. Um, and the real problem for the extreme right of the Tory party is that they do tend to be skeptic on everything. They're Eurosceptics, which is, of course, really not very sensible. 
I mean, how do you look forward to the future and not work with your neighbours? Seems to me to be a very peculiar concept. I mean, you've got to explain how you're going to get... One of the things about life is you have to get on with your neighbours. Some neighbours are not very easy, but it's much better to get on with your neighbours when you actually talk to them than to say, oh dear, I'm absolutely right, so we're going to have nothing to do with you, because then you're going to have to do something, because you've got a neighbouring wall, you know, you've got to do something. So I've never understood how you can be sceptical about European Union. You, I mean, you might want to improve it and change it, and I think lots of things we could improve and change, but you do that from inside rather than outside. But the, the so-called Eurosceptics don't listen either, because they've not got an answer as to what you do afterwards. All they think is it'd be a good idea to leave. But you try pressing them on what they do afterwards, and they can't give you an answer at all. It's an exact parallel with the, with the climate change people. They, 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 they just don't want to believe in climate change. They've got themselves into this corner. And of course it is difficult, because what climate change means is that there is a global problem which has to have a global answer and that means you've got to treat other people differently now the right in all parts of the world and I'm on the center right myself but on the, the far right in all parts of the world have had a view of the rest of the world that you boss them about that's the problem for the Americans because the American right sees you know, America's become the great imperial nation they become imperial at the very time when imperialism doesn't work and it's very embarrassing you know Britain got there first and got in the right time when it did work but it doesn't work any longer <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't work any longer and you've got to treat people not as people you can dominate you've got to treat people as people you've got to work with now that doesn't help if you are George Bush Jr because he knew very well that once he'd accepted climate change, then he had to get rid of Republican foreign policy. So he thought the best thing to do was not to accept it. And of course, that's what human beings do. Uh, if you don't like what the evidence is, you don't accept it. That's how we all, that's what smokers do, for example. It's all round, you go out, they're standing out there, you know, they're either smoking or pros doing prostitution, I don't know which, but when they're smoking, <laughs> They, they, they're standing there at the corners. They, they are in fact saying to you, I, I just don't accept the, I just don't accept it. Um, no sane person, surely, could possibly smoke in today's world. I mean, I don't see how you do. Um, because what you are saying is, all the evidence is wrong and I'm right. Well, um, you might get away with it. Um, moving on from the, the denialism side of things um, to, to the, the current state of things. So obviously, you know, the, you're right. It, it is very much of the far right. It's fairly, it is increasingly niche. It's, it's less influential than it was, and that's very much to be welcomed. Looking at the reaction from the more mainstream centrist uh, politicians and indeed business leaders, we're here at a business conference, um, are you concerned about the, the, the direction of the response to the environmental risks that we face at the moment? Because a lot of the metrics do still seem to be moving in the wrong direction. We heard earlier about the fourth, climate, fourth, fourth carbon budget. It looks like, based on current projections, we're going to miss by 7 to 10%, I think was one of the figures we heard earlier. Um, I, I, from people who accept that climate change is happening and accept that we have significant environmental risks, are you concerned about the level to which the response is commensurate? No, because we're not going to miss the fourth carbon budget, because the government's committed to it. It's got to meet it. Parliamentary vote. Um, it's a statutory requirement, and they're going to have to find means of doing it. They've accepted that, um, and there isn't any question about it. So I don't have any... I mean, I really don't have a problem. We've got a system in Britain which is going to make that impossible. So the government's got to find a way of doing it. It admits that problem. We'll produce the, fi we'll produce the fifth carbon budget later this month. And again, the government's going to have to find a way to meet that or if, if it's prepared to do it. If it isn't prepared to do it, then there's going to be a real argument about, about uh, how you're going to meet your other statutory requirement, which is to deliver 80% reduction by 2050. So there'll be, a, a, no doubt, a, a, a robust discussion, but we've tried to produce a, a, a fifth carbon budget, which uh, continues a trajectory in a proper kind of way. So the, I, I don't have a fundamental problem in Britain, and I don't have a fundamental problem around the world. I think things are very much better now than they were even six months ago. Now, I'm, I'm not being over-optimistic. I'm just answering the question, which is, do I get depressed or upset about it? No, I think that things are moving in the right direction. You know, the, the Canadian people threw out the government which wouldn't have supported and put in a government that does. Um, the Australians have a different system. They don't get rid of the government. They just change the prime minister. It's a terribly useful system. And now they've changed the prime minister. So they, they are now, if you like, on the right side. And, and if you look at the 
commitments from countries. Who would have said, even two years ago, that we'd have got sufficient commitments to keep the world within 2.7 degree, degrees? Now, that's not good enough, but it's a darn sight better than anything we could have expected at Copenhagen or the year. I mean, it is much better. And I do think we have got to be more upbeat, those of us who care about these things. Otherwise, we get on to sort of Greenpeace misery campaign, which is that we're all much better if we're miserable. So you're much better if you're colder. I don't think I'm better if I'm colder. I, I, think, I, I think I can do with less heat than some places that you're in but you but what i do think is that that, that this is not an issue of, of puritanism it's an issue of finding a way in which we can live the kind of lives that we want to live without destroying the uh, the, the, the the planet that that seems to me to be an upbeat thing and i don't think it's about sort of puritan morality indeed if it is about that we're going to lose because praise god bare bones lost in the end because people wanted christmas and mince pies and people want christmas and mince pies now so you've got to provide a mechanism whereby this clever thing called mankind can discover ways in which you can make the changes. And I think that's what the exciting thing about the papal encyclical is. It's entirely upbeat. I mean, what it says is you can do it. Just stop doing the wrong things. Do the right things. And that seems to me to be very cheering. Mm -hmm. And so right from the Pope at one end to... Paul Polman, I don't know whether you'd like to be put at the other end, but Paul Polman and Unilever and business, the real business leadership and the sort of the sort of speech that we had from from David Cameron in his uh, report back to Parliament uh, on the G20 summit, when uh, climate change had not dropped back down the the agenda, it, right up there next door to the terrorism, even at the moment in which terrorism was bound to be absolutely a point. It, it, it's a crucial message for business, isn't it? A, a uh, on the technical level, what you were talking about, carbon budgets there, is that if the policies aren't there now, they're going to come. There, there is this, this, is, this thing's legally binding. And globally, there is that direction of travel, and it's only going to accelerate. I think that's... It, it, it's, I mean, that seems to be the message to business from a lot of people increasingly, that you've got to start planning for this transition because it's already happening. Yeah, and I mean, uh, uh, I can't let this go past without saying, you know, I mean, you've got to do it in a much more progressive and sensible way than we've done up to now. You see, you listen to this story about the Thames Tideway. It's a Thames Tideway. It's a total nonsense. I mean, it's an old-fashioned Three Gorges Dam answer, and we still have it. It's going to cost a hell of a amount of money, and it's exactly the wrong answer. Do you know what we're doing? We're having a great big pipe, and every time we have a storm, we're going to mix it with shit, and we're going to send it out down the pipe. Now, you live in a, we live in a country in which we actually need the water. What on earth are we doing not collecting the water? And, and of course, if we had local systems and, and, and really faced up to it, and the real trouble is they're all engineers. You know, they want a big project. It's boys' toys. It's good, big stuff. And I just want to say to them, that's not environmentally sensible. You want a sensible local issue, local solution to all those problems, not this great big concept, which does remind me of, you know, re re uh, reversing the the, 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 the the flow of the rivers in 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 uh, in in, in, um, uh, in Russia. And I, of course, I'm sitting there quietly and being polite and nice as I am, um, and so didn't interrupt him, but, but I just think it's exactly the example of what we shouldn't be doing. We're going to charge every single person in London money every single year for the next 80 years for doing the wrong thing, whereas what we should have been doing is a much less intrusive concept where you actually try to use the water that we get in the surges and you use those effectively and you put that water into the river and you use the Thames then as a carrier for that water. You can even purify it lower down if that's what you want to do and you s really take seriously that fact and you improve the sewage arrangements at the same time. Does, um, does that concern about big projects, big infrastructure projects extend to the energy space, because there's this big debate going on currently, which um, which obviously the Committee on Climate Change has been informing to, to some degree about Hinkley Point, about a, a more gas-based system. Um, Amber Rudd's speech made some fascinating um, speech yesterday, had some fascinating points about um, 
that it not being government's place to decide, we could still end up with a more decentralized renewables energy storage based system. But obviously she was very much signaling the preference currently seems to be more centralized gas, offshore wind, nuclear. Are, are you concerned that maybe we could end up, you know, what you were saying about Thames Tideware with big costs, long term project, putting a lot on people's bills? A lot of uh, a lot of groups would say that's exactly the case that's going to happen with Hinkley Point. Is there a is well, there a I, parallel? No, I think it's a fundamental difference. I mean, the, the, the difficulty here is that we don't know what the answer is going to be in 2035. Um, uh, all we have to, uh, what we have to do is to see that we don't close off the opportunities that we would have. And the Committee on Climate Change has made it clear that on the present knowledge, we don't think that you can provide the low carbon energy that we need without having some element of nuclear. That's Now, whether this is a good deal or not, it's a different issue. Whether there wasn't a better way of doing it is a different issue. And I don't think I'm either, uh, in sense it's, I, I don't believe in mission creep, so I'm, that's not my job. But my job is to say, there's no doubt that we need to have this. Now, if in fact tomorrow somebody comes up with a cheap, reliable method of storing electricity, then you change the whole world. Now, I think somebody will, but I'm not prepared to risk the, w risk the world on saying that's what's going to happen. That's the kind of choice I don't think you need to do. The, the point about the Thames Tideway Tunnel is there is today uh, alternative an alternative method of delivering those goods, which is now, today, better than the one they're proposing. Trouble is, they're proposing something which they decided on 15 years ago, and that's like the Three Gorges Dam. You make the decision long time ago, then once you've got it all in the tramways, you find it very difficult to change it. So you go around trying to pretend that it is actually the answer, when I don't think it is. Um, as far as uh, nuclear is concerned, we, we, we need that on the system at the moment because we wouldn't have sufficient security of base level supply. We could do that in different ways. Uh, we could do it, for example, if we were able to produce um, uh, more tidal and more lagoon uh, energy. We could do it if we uh, had a much more effective international linkage system. Uh, we could do it by some imaginative things. For example, I believe that if we went in for double summertime, we could contribute hugely towards this because you not only use less energy, but you also can use the interconnector much more effectively because other people have a different peak and therefore you are able to get the energy that you need at a different time. And I use that example, um, which intrigued the Sunday Times. You know, you give, give them an, all, an hour and a half on all the technicalities, that's right. they don't print any of that, just the story of the, new, of the idea of double summertime. But I, I say that because sometimes the answer is to think outside the box. And I, I'm very keen on doing that because otherwise I think we, we get caught into particular ways of, uh, of thing. But I also do say to the green movement, you know, you really do have to stop hanging on to means. It's the end that you're after. We're, we're, our end is, is the outcome. The Climate Change Committee is concerned with the outcome. We set targets which have to be met. I don't mind if Amber Rudd meets that target by standing on her head and waving her legs in the air. If, she, if that works, then we can do it. I, I don't think we ought to be hung up on any particular mechanism. But you do have to warn people that however much you like offshore wind, and I'm a great supporter of both solar and wind, I really have long-standing support for that. I just say, at the moment, if you relied just on that, there would be outages. So therefore, you can't do that. You've got to replace particularly that part of the energy system at the moment that we get from our own nuclear power stations, which will which will have to be closed. Yeah. Um, I love the idea of double summertime. I remember the last time it was um, campaigned for and there was a big push for people to take it up. Uh, um, Mr Hitchens in the mail started to refer to it as Berlin time and, uh, and, and insisted that it was, a, it was a European plot and we should stop it. But there, there well, we go. Mr Hitchens um, is against it, I'm for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, should be a life rule for everyone, to be honest. Um, 
just finally to wrap up, um, there was a fascinating debate earlier in the day about innovation and, and the clean tech sector. And, and one, of the, one of the big things that came out of it was the sense that the sector needs to sell itself a little bit more, needs to be more optimistic, more assertive in, in building public support and building political support. Um, as, a, as a politician um, who had, had considerable success um, selling your vision to voters and, 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 and winning over votes, is there any advice you could give uh, to the clean tech sector as a whole, to the people in this room, as to how to really start to get a bit more traction, a bit more um, profile in terms of you know what are really exciting technologies and a as you, you said a very optimistic vision, a vision that we can we can sell to people as, as creating a better world and and start to maybe enjoy some of the benefits that come with that. Well, I mean, the first thing is to be optimistic rather than miserable because nobody will buy misery. And, um, and people who, who work in misery um, find that it, they're, very, they're miserable themselves and, and, they, and they make everybody else miserable and in the end you lose, so don't be miserable. Well, <clears throat> the first thing I think is, um, for goodness sake, sp you know, talk English, write English instead of uh, um, uh, technological gobbledygook. I mean, I really do think that somebody in every company has to read what is actually put out and recognize how most of it doesn't mean anything to ordinary people. It's no good. The words we use are so unacceptable. And you just have to try to speak in a language which people understand and that they can catch hold of. So we're not about emissions, we're about pollution. Just, I mean, people know what pollution is. They have no idea what emission control is. And so you, you, it, I just want you to use words which, which strike that. And I've always thought that a good aspect of your, um, your marketing and sales business ought to be to read the stuff that's put out to say, would that appeal to anybody who wanted to buy something? So that's the, the first thing. The second thing is an awful lot of the people who ought to be making a much better fist of it are really business-to-business -business providers, and therefore they're not used to talking to the general public, and therefore it's quite important to have better links with those who are used to talking to the general public because it's the retailers and the and, and the fast-moving consumer goods people who really understand that. That's why listening to leaders of people like Unilever and Coca-Cola and, 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 uh, uh, and General Mills who, who actually talk to the general public, they, they are very valuable to us because they know, know how to do it. The third thing is, for goodness sake, be simple. One of the difficulties I think people have is that they're determined to be absolutely accurate. And what you need to... You, they don't say that when they're advertising. They, they, they've got a simple story to tell. And, OK, you can have a star and you can put at the bottom, this is based upon this or that or the other and it's got this amount of error possibility. But for goodness sake, tell a, uh, say it simply. And the last thing is, remember... That, it, that what sells things is narrative. You have to tell a story. And the story has got to include your audience. So if you've got a wonderful new piece of technology which will mean that, I don't know, that their water will be cleaner and better, then start talking the story of having cleaner and better walk water. Not that you have an inter-vibrating, specifically managed... Um, universally adaptable, widespread, and unbelievably clever gizmo, by which time you've turned them all off. But say the water will taste like real water and not like what we get in London, where is he? Um, <laughs> then you, uh, you, you begin to get them to be interested. Um, Lord Dean, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs>